Welcome to Bible class at the Greenberry Church of Christ. What a blessing it is to be with you in this continued reading from a portion of Israel's history that is not a happy portion. And yet I think there's a lot of good things for us to learn from this. And while it's pretty serious all the way through, and certainly the text focus today is very serious, at the same time, I know it is the Word of God, and as the Apostle would say, it was written for our instruction. And uh, therefore, I think we ought to be people who give careful attention to the instruction of the Lord as we receive it from these various readings from First and Second Kings and also the prophets who prophesied during that period of time, and particularly Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah. So today we will continue our reading from the uh, book of Amos. This text that comes much, much later than the events of which we will read today, uh, yet it, it's the Lord says it all. Of course, the Lord would know. But if you will read with me from Matthew 12, 25, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father in heaven, help us to take seriously, particularly as it can apply to our families, as it can apply to our church. But help us to take seriously the words of the Lord that we just read, that we will not be divided against one another. And so, Father, we pray, earnestly pray for our country that right now seems to be very, very divided. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us to be folk who can contribute to the healing of that division and that our witness to the goodness of your word, to the life that we can have in Jesus Christ and the hope that we receive from him, that all of that together can be communicated in a way as, again, the Apostle would say, to make the teaching very, very attractive. And I pray, Father, that we can be a part of doing that sort of thing. Oh, Lord, we praise your name this day. We pray, Father, that your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, thank you so much for all the things that we enjoy that make our lives uh, without a lot of uh, worry, uh, make our lives a lot more comfortable than many, many people in our world. And I pray, Lord, that as we give you thanks, that we will also show you thanks in the generosity we have in helping others. The Lord, please forgive us of our sins when we fail to do all of the things about which we've already prayed and even more. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will forgive us of our sins. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Help us, God, to always look for that way of escape whenever we are in a place of, of real temptation. Help us to flee just as Joseph fled the temptation in the household of Potiphar. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity for us now to be around your word this morning. Bless the reading of your word. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Well, in the previous lesson, there was a bit of an introduction to Amos, to the man, to his sermons, and to his book. Amos uh, was called by God during the reign of two kings. You can find out about that in Amos 1.1. But he was called during the reign of Jeroboam II of Israel and Uzziah of Judah. Though he lived in Judah, he was actually called to preach more to Israel than to Judah. Other prophets during this period of time included Hosea, Jonah in Israel, and Isaiah in Judah. And we'll be reading in future lessons together, future studies together from Hosea and Isaiah. The history of all of this is found in First and Second Kings. I can't recall, I'm sorry right now, the exact chapter for Jeroboam II. 
I think it may be about 2 Kings 14. You can look there and start there and then look on either side of that and you'll find uh, the, the narrative history about, uh, about Jeroboam II. That's in 2 Kings, I believe. And you would also find the equivalent in the Chronicles as well. It's the Word of God. And the Word of God is found in, as we receive it, both in the narrative that you're going to find in uh, First and Second Kings and Chronicles, but also you find the Word of God in the separate par- parallel writings that are the prophets, the words of the prophets. Now, of course, there are some prophets simply embedded in the narrative story, like Elijah, like Micaiah, like several others. But there are also some prophets who stand apart from that, who really don't appear in the narrative part for the most part. Now, so, uh, some will, but, but we know more about them from the writings that have been collected in the 12 prophetic works. The uh, 12 prophetic works run from Hosea through Malachi. We know that is the, the minor prophets, but in the Hebrew Bible, uh, they're all collected not in separate little books, but all in one book and known simply in, as a single book of the twelve. And Amos is the third book of the twelve. About Amos, he is a shepherd. He is a dresser of sycamore figs. He was uh, from Tekoa, the area of Tekoa, which was about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. That would put it not very far from Bethlehem. That puts it in, in I, I think you could fairly say, some sheep country because we know of another shepherd who was in that region and who was called by God to be a king. He was during the reign uh, during the reign of Jeroboam the second, as I've already mentioned, in Uzziah in Judah. But actually, Amos goes to Israel. He's going to head toward Bethel, and actually, Bethel was not very far from the borderline between Israel and Judah, and not all that far from Jerusalem. And so uh, Amos is going to go not all that far home to do his preaching. Um, so being sent from Israel, I, I would like to... Re, uh, so I, I've, I've stated those things. I would like to say just a word about Jeroboam the second because this is sort of the, the narrative background behind everything that on Jer- uh, that Hosea, I'm sorry, Amos is preaching about. One of the first things we notice in the text is that Jeroboam did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and it says he did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Well, Jeroboam the son of Nebat would have been this Jeroboam's. Uh, about ninth uh, grand great grandfather, ninth great something like that. He's pretty. It's 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 been quite a while, several several generations, but still he follows after the way of Jeroboam as many of them did. But the one thing to his credit, which actually contributed to some of the good times that Israel enjoyed, was that he restored the border of Israel. That is territory that had been taken by some enemies from previous kings. He was able to exploit the weakness of his uh, pagan neighbors and to take back some territory. And this resulted in a time of of material prosperity in in, uh, these days of Jeroboam II and Amos. I want to say just a word about the design of the book of Amos. This is kind of helpful in terms of especially the part that we look at today. Our, our first previous lesson was chapter 1 and 2, uh, messages to the neighboring kingdoms, Judah and Israel. And if you look, if you, if you read those starting at about 1, 4, or 5, uh, verse 4 or 5 in chapter 1, he starts talking about Damascus and then he goes down to Gaza and then Tyre and then uh, I believe it was Edom next or maybe Moab next. Uh, 
But just look at that and what, what kind of, and then look at a map and what, what Amos did in delivering the word of the Lord or what you could say God was doing when it says, thus says the Lord. He spoke a word of judgment to all of Israel's neighbors and then to Israel's basically brethren south of their, uh, of their uh, region in, in the land of Judah. And then at the very end, you hear uh, Amos preaching against, uh, against Israel. In other words, uh, the sermon would have gotten a lot of attention as he, as he said things that were, were directed to all the neighbors. Yeah, preacher, you know, let them have it. But then what begins to happen is that the message gets closer and closer. And then in chapters 3 through 6, you have a collection of poems that express the word of the Lord to Israel. So uh, in that little pattern that you're going to find there in chapters 1 and 2, the, f the focus comes down to Israel and now it's all on Israel. And then the focus and the attention stays on Israel in chapters 7 through 9, which are not poems, but just re reports of visions of Amos. It's actually in poetic language, but it's really the report of visions of Amos depicting the coming judgment of Israel. And so in this hour today, we're going to continue to hear from Amos, remembering that it's not Amos who is speaking. It is the Lord roaring from Zion. It is, thus says the Lord, which starts at 1-3 and many other places following. It is, as we will hear from chapter 7, verses 15 through 16, The Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel, now therefore hear the word of the Lord. So Amos makes it very clear that this is not his word, this is not his opinion, this is the word from the Lord. And we're going to focus on chapters 4 and 5. So if you'd like to open up your text to chapters 4 and 5, and we'll say some words under the title of Empty Offering. So I want to uh, actually, before we get there, and this is actually a, a bit of word of introduction, we, we need to hear what is going to be said in chapters 4, 5, and beyond against the background of these verses right here. Chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? Well, let's focus on you only have I known? Uh, to, to know could also be translated, or the word know here, uh, or known, could also be translated chosen. You only have I chosen, is what God is saying. And as such, the phrase implies the elect status of Israel before God. God selected one family, from among all the families of the earth to be in a special relationship with them and to speak of them in these terms, you only have I known, should have reminded the Israelite audience listening to Amos of Exodus 19 when as Israel was at the foot of Mount Sinai before the Lord there and the Lord said to them, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. They should have also remembered from Deuteronomy chapter 7, from the book of other books of Moses. In Deuteronomy 7, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples. So out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, God is saying, you only have I chosen. You only have I known. 
It all goes back to God's calling of Abraham and raising up from Abraham this people and this nation intending to bless all the earth through them. And so it really uh, should get our attention. It would get anyone's attention, especially those initially hearing this, this, uh, pro- this prophetic word from, from Amos and from the Lord. Uh, but it should get our attention. When he speaks of that elect status, then he immediately follows it with, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. And part of that is because I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. In other words, God is reminding them of what he had done for them in bringing them out of slavery, bringing them to Sinai, offering a covenant of relationship, which, by the way, the people at Sinai had said, whatever God has spoken, we will do. So they actually accepted the covenant. But as we know, time and time again, they had uh, forsaken the covenant. They had broken the covenant, even though God had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, I will punish you. God is now going to punish Israel, for they had broken the covenant time and time again. They had broken the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. They had broken the second commandment, you shall not make any graven images. And here, uh, Amos is actually delivering this message in Bethel, which was one of the sites at which Jeroboam I had put up a golden calf and said, this is what brought you out of Egypt and and led the people to the worship of that golden calf there at, at Bethel. There was also another one at Dan. And so God is going to punish them not only because they are now as idolatrous as their neighbors, but as you read the whole of the sermon, I would call it a a collection of sermons actually of Amos, as you read all of that, they were also abusing one another, abusing people just like their neighbors had done. So, I want to focus just as some comments. We're actually probably going to circle around to this again. It's really important. That is, their story was God had chosen them and brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And, and because God had given them freedom, and not only freedom, but a covenant, and not only a covenant, but a land, He had done all of these things for them. But you could sum it all up in the phrase, I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. That was their story. They were a rescued, redeemed people. But now they are behaving in ways that suggest they had forgotten their story completely. Actually, it was a story that was to be told again and again every Passover. But I am confident at this time, in, the, in Israel, at this time in Israel, the Passover has been completely forgotten. The story is no longer being told. And the fact is they had forgotten who they were. They had been led astray by their kings and leaders into idolatry, very willing to go into idolatry and other kinds of sins against the Lord and against one another. This whole matter of remembering one's story is so important. You, this is a piece of this that we can apply to ourselves for we too have a story and it is a story that we must not forget. So do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? This question is the first of a series of questions intended to show that nothing just happens. There is a cause for each result. So that the judgment, the punishment that is coming is not random. It's not arbitrary. It's not spiteful on the part of God. The preacher is saying to Israel, which is the word of the Lord, that your iniquities have brought you to this. There is, God is saying there is plan and purpose with resulting consequence. 
and the consequences are going to be laid out in this portion of the book of Isaiah. So speaking to Christians, have we not found our story in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have we not received and made a covenant with the Lord in our own baptism? Listen to Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In other words, we have the opportunity to, do, uh, to, 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 to live the kind of life that God wants us to live, which is exactly what He was wanting of His people Israel. And then the Lord's Supper is a covenant meal. And this all forms our story. And we, we, we dare not forsake our story at all. Now I want to read the text. Uh, I don't always do this, but I, I really prefer, I want to read the whole chapter and then we're going to come back and look at parts of it. So if you will, open up with me. Maybe it's best to have a print uh, copy of the Scriptures at this point. But I'm going to read Amos 4, 1 through 13. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring that we may drink. The Lord has sworn by His holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you. Now what I want you to do is listen for their sins and listen to the consequences that will result. The Lord has sworn by His holiness that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take, away, take you away with hooks even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into Harmon, declares the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them. For you love to do so, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I also withheld the rain from you when there were yet three months to harvest. I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain, the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight and milled you. Your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured. And yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses. And I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils. And yet, you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a brand plucked out of the burning. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, Thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. There is a pattern to all of this. And first of all, Amos confronts the wealthy, particularly the wealthy women, and speaks of their destiny in verses 1 through 3. And then Yahweh speaks of their religiosity, but of course it is, it is religious worship before idols, and he speaks of it very sarcastically. It probably surprises us, but that's the nature of it nevertheless. Then Yahweh speaks of sending the covenant curses, and still they didn't repent. And, what, and that's verses 6 
through 11, the bulk of the chapter. And, and the, the, the reality is they should not have been surprised at all about this. And then there's Yahweh's threat of personal temporal visitation. In other words, there is the coming day of the Lord, prepare to meet your God. And then it all ends, this little section really fits together well. It all ends with Amos's doxology to God as creator, and therefore he is the rightful judge of all. So hear this word. Bashan was a very fertile plain and mountain range on on the east side of the Jordan, actually, it's better for us to speak of it. As in, 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 this is the area known as the Golan Heights this day and time. So it's east of the Jordan. There's a mountain uh, ridge that runs down, a uh, mountain range or ridge, actually, that runs down the east side of the, most of the east side of the Jordan uh, from Galilee to the Dead Sea. And up on top of that plateau was a very, very fertile place and it was known for its cattle. It's a region then that was very prosperous in, in Dunes. So who, who might the cows of Bashan be? Well, he's talking about the wives of the wealthy men who are abusing the poor for their own luxury. The, the women are crying out. These rich women are crying out for more and more drink. And they're their husbands are crushing and exploiting the needy. They are oppressing the poor. They're crushing the needy in order to satisfy what their wives want. And so he starts his little sermon with you cows of Bashan. I think from a preaching perspective, this is a good, good, good way to make sure you're not going to be invited back to speak in that congregation. The Lord is sworn by His holiness. And so... The plight of the poor and oppressed in Israel had not gone unnoticed by God. And God has withheld His judgment for the right time, but it is now coming. And so Amos speaks of the impending disaster in, in terms of what the, these, these women can expect and many, many others. They're all going to be led away by the Assyrians uh, with fish hooks. I'll show you a, a picture in just a moment as to what that would have been like. And, and more than once, the, the, the Israelites were led, at not only Israel, but also Judah, are led into captivity with a fish hook in their nose, attached to a rope tugged by one of their enemies, by one of their conquerors. And so that's, that's their future that God describes here. Come to Bethel and transgress. And here's the part that is uh, done with a tone of sarcastic mockery. So if you want to come and worship, which is sinful worship to begin with, which is the worship of idols, uh, if you want to come and worship, well, just come and do even more. Of course, it, we should hear this in a sarcastic sort of manner as Amos boldly steps forward and challenges in this sort of way this very unauthorized practice. This is a, he's, he's calling them to offer sacrifices, but these sacrifices again are to the golden calf and other forms of idolatry. And so he is, he is actually mocking their worship instead of truly calling because they're not responsive to the worship of God. And so what are, part of what they're doing is this matter of sacrificing every morning. Well, in the law, that includes sacrifices morning and evening. So in a sense, what they've done is they remember part of the law, but they've changed it in, and incorporated it into their idol worship. And typically, this matter of thanksgiving uh, offering a sacrifice of thanksgiving would be to, uh, uh, to, to either thank God for deliverance that has been enjoyed or thank God for deliverance that is coming, for goodness that God has given or will give, and yet deliverance is not coming. They may be offering a sacrifice with that sort of background, but in this, a sacrifice of thanksgiving with that sort of background.
But in this case, there is no deliverance coming. And one of the sad things is, notice uh, you, you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and then it says you publish them. That's probably better translated as you will find in other translations. And you boast about it. This is like standing on the street corner praying so everybody can see you praying or going into the temple. This is Jesus talking in, out of the Sermon uh, on the Mount uh, or going into the, to the temple and making a big old uh, contribution just so everybody can see you. That's, what, that, that's the, the attitude of, of spirituality, so to speak, that, I, that is being spoken about here. And so you, you do these things and you publish it. You, you boast about those things. Brag about it everywhere. And yet, here, here's what I've done. I've, I've done some things. This is God speaking. The, I've done some things trying to get your attention, trying to get you to call upon me. And yet, you haven't done it. Even though you didn't have enough bread to get your teeth dirty, uh, is, is the meaning of verse 6. Uh, even though it didn't rain in some places. Oh, it did in other places, but it didn't rain. I withheld rain. And yet, it didn't get your attention. Here's a, another instance of the theological meaning of drought. And, and then there, there's plant disease and locust. There's plague and war. And one of the things that I was prompted to do at this point in the reading of these, uh, of these consequences of their sins and of these things that God had done in order to try to get their attention, they had so much uh, from David and others in terms of how they could call upon the Lord. I thought of Psalm 13, 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? If it hadn't rained in a long time, maybe that's the prayer to pray. And they had the language for that. How long will you hide your face from me? Or they could have prayed as David prayed, against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Or Psalm 53, uh, verses uh, 3 and 4, I think. Oh God, save me. I'm sorry, this is not right. I think it's 54, 1 and 2. Oh God, save me by your name. Vindicate me by your might, oh God. Hear my prayer. Hear my cry. There was so much language from the Psalms of David and others that gave them a way to speak to God in this sort of time. And yet they didn't call upon that at all. They did not return to the Lord. And the final sign of whatever happened, and we really don't know. But it was like the upheaval of Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, it really should have gotten their attention, but it did not. We don't like to think of God causing His calamity, uh, yet, and I, I, that's really a very complex question. I would want to hasten to say that not all these calamities are at the hand of the Lord. And here, even in this context, though I, the Lord's speaking of doing those things, but He's doing it in response to what they had done or failed to do. And He's seeking to... And so, when, when times get tough, where do we turn? Do we turn to ourselves? Do we turn to the government? Or do we turn to God? That's a good question for us to be asking this day and time. Even though I plucked you like a, a, a burning stick out of, out of the burning, and, and yet you didn't return to me. And so the Lord says, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Uh, and why? Well, I have the right. I am the Creator. I formed the mountains, created the wind, uh, I made the morning darkness. I tread the heights of the earth in all creation. The Lord of, the Lord Yahweh, the God of hosts, is His name. And so, this prepare to meet your God implies the relationship that God 
had originally had with Israel. Of course, they had forsaken that, and yet they are being called to account. Now I want to read a little bit more as we move to the next part of this section. Of, and remember, this is a section uh, that's directed toward Israel. And I'm going to read uh, 5, 14 through 24. Seek good and not evil. Now, all of a sudden, that sort of stands out on the page. I'll get back to it. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious uh, to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas. They shall call the for farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why should you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let's walk through pieces of that. Even in the midst of messages that have a tone of mockery and sarcasm and, and warning, there, there are these occasions of invitation. Seek good. Hate evil. Do good. Establish justice. Oh, oh Israel, if you'd only do these things, if you'd only return to me and do these things, then, uh, then I will receive you and forgive you. Therefore, thus says the Lord. But, but that's not what's going to happen. So you have... Uh, in, in this section and other parts of, of Amos, you, there's, there's, a, there's a hint of hope. And yet he knows that they are not going to, to respond to, to it at all. There will be wailing. Even the farmers are going to be. Not, they're not the professional uh, wailers at all. The farmers will join in with the wailing. Oh, do you desire the day of the Lord? Of course, in a sense, they wanted the day of the Lord to come thinking that it would be directed against their enemies. But what God is saying here is, oh, no, no. When the day of the Lord comes, it will come because of you. This day of judgment on God's enemies is often referred to in Scripture as the day of the Lord. And here, that day is going to be directed to, uh, to Israel. And even though God will, will also direct judgments against their enemies, as we've already heard in chapters 1 and 2, nevertheless, what this is about is God's wayward people. And so there's kind of a, a series of little illustrations here that, that uh, uh, are intended to help them get a sense of what this day of the Lord is like. You flee from a lion and you run into a bear. Or you escape into the house just to lean against the wall and you get bitten by a snake. For the day of the Lord is, is, is going to be a day of darkness for you, not light. You might have been expecting it to be light. Why? Because I hate, I despise your feasts, I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. And, and there is language here that we really need to hear in our own context, and that's part of it. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings. Well, we don't come to God with burnt offerings, but we come to God with contributions. We come to God with the, the, uh, the sacrifice of praise from our lips. And so part of what's going on here is 
is uh, they, they've done some things that look like religion. It could even look like they're worshiping God, but, but they're not. They're, they're, their hearts are far from them. And God doesn't want to see any more of this at all. Even though you do this, I will not look upon them. And so I don't want to hear your singing anymore. I don't want to listen to the melody of the harps of, that, that you're using in praise unto me. I don't want to hear that anymore. Instead, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This, is, this, in a sense, is what Amos is all about. Because the part of this that probably should have emphasized a little, especially at the beginning of chapter 4, and that is the oppression of the poor, the crushing of the needy. And that's one of the great concerns in the book of Amos. Amos is all about social justice. It is about kindness and help for those who are in great need. And, uh, and they've not provided it at all. In fact, they have abused their positions of power and wealth, and it's time for justice to come, rolling down like waters and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. Actually, with this very word, vivid word picture, Amos is pleading with the people to allow this to happen. Maybe things will change. Some of you will remember that this was a verse out of Amos quoted by Martin Luther King in his very famous speech delivered from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. And as a preacher and one who knew the Bible, he would have known that he's not just trying to use, use the language, but he was really calling uh, the nation at that time to, to provide justice and, and goodness for all as he worked in the civil rights movement. And, 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 and God, God, that's what God wanted for Israel. That's what God wants for the United States of America. That's what God wants for all the whole world, that there will be justice and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So if Amos were to return to this 21st century setting, how would he view our society? I found this quote through Amos's words. We can still hear the call to learn from Israel's hypocrisy and the disastrous consequences of their sins. It's a call to embrace true worship of God. In other words, not to come together on the Lord's Day, do our service, sing, all of that. And at the same time, our hearts are far from God. And we are abusing people in other kinds of ways. Of course, we know it can happen. And maybe we've even done some of that. And if we've done some of that, we need to turn to God right now. It is a call to embrace the true worship of God <clears throat> that not only has a great service on Sunday morning, but it leads to justice and righteousness and loving our neighbor. And that's what the book of Amos is all about. About their worship that multiplied their transgression. This makes me think of 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen, <clears throat> when the apostle wrote about the assemblies of the church in Corinth. But in the following instructions... I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. That's the kind of circumstance that uh, and shares in similar ways to what Amos was talking about. I, here, I thought of, uh, I should have checked my, here we go. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming. Sing with me. By and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? 
Are you ready for the judgment day? The day of the Lord. It's coming. We know that. Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? You know, I think in my time that old gospel song has fallen out of favor a bit, but it asks a pretty important question because God said to the folk in Amos, through Amos' sermon, prepare to meet your God, and we will. So we need to work steadily toward, uh, I'm going to skip through these verses. Y'all can go look it up. If you have a Christian hymns number two songbook, it's number 23 in that little songbook that I grew up on. I want to get to this prayer and pray with you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are often disturbed by the suffering and injustice that we see all about us. Sometimes it's overwhelming. I pray, Father, that you'll keep us from comfortably accepting our world as it is and that you will give us the strength and wisdom to do whatever we can, wherever we are, to bring about the justice and righteousness of which Amos spoke. In the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being present. I really do appreciate the opportunity. This is good for me to spend some time in the book of the Twelve in the Minor Prophets. In the next lesson, we're going to look at Hosea 1 and 2 and God's love for Israel. There is so much more to their preaching, and we need to hear it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.